Hi, I'm Martine Bernard. And I'm Marty Haas. And this is Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books. Today we're on a safari. Ready, Monty? I'm ready to make literacy an adventure. That sounds like a good theme for this show. Make literacy an adventure. I see you've packed some gear there. Yes, as every parent knows, you don't head out without the essentials. Snacks, water, and a good book that will help us talk about this trip. Amazing Animal Facts. That's one of Dr. Marichek's books that you'll find on our website. It's perfect for going to animal adventures. It is. I see you've brought some binoculars too. Want to borrow them? No thanks. I'm going to join the families that are having a hands-on experience. Ooh, that'll be fun. And a great way to learn. Oh, and I brought some notebooks for us to jot down the techniques Ed Laquadera uses in his presentations. I hear kids really take in the information he shares. And then express themselves. Those are recipes for success. I'll need to talk to him about how he does that. Now, Ed's the founder of Animal Adventures? Yes, and he was one of only 20 people in the world to be invited to attend the first American Zoological Association school on crocodilian biology and captive management. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Speaking of a mouthful, isn't that our picnic basket? There goes our lunch. What is this crazy looking thing? A hedgehog. Does it, looking at him, what do you think his defense is? His long spines. Now, when we touch him, I think he's going to feel like a hairbrush. How many people here are afraid of a hairbrush? Just me? Oh, you too? Okay. Now, he is nocturnal. So what does he wish he was doing right now? Sleeping. So nocturnal means what? Stay up at night. What's it feel like? Is he rough like the bearded dragon? No. Prickly like the hedgehog? Yes. But if he comes out and it's very dark, they see the white fur. If he comes out in the day, they can easily see what? what the black fur. So he can't, what is, what is that the bearded dragon could do? What was that? Camouflage. So can this guy camouflage? No. So if an animal can't camouflage, then he must have another line of what? Defense. Defense. So let's talk about that. So Ed, Animal Adventures is more than a zoo. It's an educational experience? Yeah, what we call ourselves is an education uh, enrichment center. We want to make our shows fun and exciting, but we really, really want to uh, theme to be education. Now this is what a skunk does. He walks or waddles, in this guy's case, right? And he waddles along and he starts sniffing and he says, oh, those are people's feet. I know that smell anywhere. And then he's going to want to scare you away because he doesn't know that you're so nice because he hasn't met you before, right? So he says, hey, you, out of my way. And he stamps on the ground. And that scares the animals away. And if they don't run away, he shuffles back and he goes, I told you, out of my way. And he shuffles back. And he'll do that five or six times. If that doesn't work, then he'll back up about 10 or 15 feet. You know what he does then? Pray. Not yet. He charges you and he pretends to be, well, what animal charges? A rhino. a rhino, a bull, many different animals charge. And right before he gets to you, he takes his front feet and he uses them to stop. What do we use to stop in our cars or on our bikes? Our what? Our brakes. He uses his front, front feet for brakes and that makes his back end swing around. Then he looks over his shoulder and he says, if you're still there, you're going to get what? Sprayed, and his tail goes up, and psh, you get it just like that. Okay. You told a story about a skunk, and at the same time, you were teaching. I find that kids, especially during the school year, um, I do a lot of after-school programs, and they've already been taught in a very structured way all day. And if I come in and just lecture to them, they kind of turn me off. So I found that if I can uh, entwine it with a story, they don't even really realize how much they're learning. Uh, but they're taken in quite a bit because at the end of the story when I ask 
questions and do a review, they have all the answers. So I think a story format is a great way to teach the kids. Now, how can parents at home who may not have all of the ingredients for a story use storytelling to inspire their kids to, to maybe research animals in books? Uh, one fun thing that, that, that we do is we, um, I'll show the girls a uh, picture of an animal in a book and I'll ask them if they can help make up a funny story about the animal and we, we'll put actual facts like where it's from, what kind of animal it is, what it eats, but in a funny story, you know. So my girls might say, well I was a monkey in, you know, Madagascar hopping through the trees when I met, you know, and they make up their own stories and it's a, it, it really seems to be a great way for them to remember and it's fun for the family. Monty, what are you reading there? Well, Martine, I'm learning about monkeys. Why don't you use the book, make up a story, put yourself in it, just like Ed does with his daughters. Well, that'd be easy. It says here that monkeys have hands just like humans, and some even have prehensile tails. Hmm, if I had a tail... Well, Monty's off monkeying around, Let's see what Lori Joy and Chip have to tell us about using pictures to inspire all sorts of fun. Here's an idea from Chip. He knows you and your children find pictures to talk about everywhere, even on quilts. Today we have a quilt with bunnies and carrots. Sometimes there's nothing like the real thing to create interest in a story, but I can't pull a rabbit out of a hat. Chip, what could we use? Carrots, great idea. Once you start munching, you might ask, do ladybugs eat carrots? Oh, that'd be silly. Do bunnies like carrots? Well, let's see. Let's take a closer look. Look at all those carrots. And what are those bunnies doing? That's right, they're sleeping. When you talk about it, add some new vocabulary. Look at the swirling wind and sound and motion. And now you want to make up a story together using your new vocabulary. And then let your child act it out. When you can, choose pictures that lead to exciting adventures. Do you want to go to the pet store, Chip? All right. Great idea. We'll feed the bunnies. I've never been around so many different types of animals before. I've never seen so many exotic creatures. I had cats growing up. Monty, did you have any pets? I had some turtles and I caught some tadpoles. I had a dog, I even caught a squirrel in the house once. Well, I wonder what kind of pets Ed had growing up. I can't imagine, but I sure can find out. Ed, how did you wind up combining animals, kids, literacy, the, the whole nine yards? How did that come about? Well, um, I grew up really liking animals. I have a very large family, uh, six brothers and sisters. And my mom, very uh, easygoing mom, who said we can have pets that we want as long as we will go to the library, study them, and understand what it takes to take care of them. Because with uh, seven kids to raise, she said she wasn't going to be cleaning <laughs> animal cages as well, especially when we were interested in boa constrictors and alligators and things like that. So A smart mom, she said, to yeah. the library. Yeah, so we spent a lot of time at the library. Um, Owned. I still have. I have uh, some animal books. I was looking at them with the other day um, from 1972. So, um, you know, I have a lot of uh, a lot of animal books dating way back. What do we have here? Anyone know? Uh, Yell it out. Alligator. An alligator. Now we know it's not a crocodile. How? How do we know it's not a crocodile? Because it's teeth. Because its teeth. Uh, because, um, because the scales don't point up. That's right. His teeth are hanging down. He doesn't have a fourth tooth that's pointing up. What about this nose? This is kind of round and flat, isn't it? What about a crocodile? What does that look like? It's all pointed, stretches out. That's pointed and stretches out. Does anybody here ever go to the beach at all? Like to dig in the sand? I love it. I, I all the time down to the beach, digging in the sand. If we dig far enough in the sand, what do we find eventually? If you're close to the water, what do you? What if you dig through the mud? What do you find? Water. Now, alligators are very important in the wild because you know what they do? Mm -hmm. When the water dries up, they take their nose and they dig down through the mud until they find more water so the animals have things to drink. Let's yeah. open up the mouth. Anybody here have a mouth? Is everybody's mouth open? Okay. Alligators' mouths open very big. And what do we call this? What do we call this? That's his tongue. 
Now here's a big word for you, okay? He has a little flap that keeps the water from going down his belly. And that word is called an epiglottis. Can we say epiglottis? epiglottis. Okay, so if I'm talking to young kids, younger than you, I'll say he has a little flap, a little door. If I'm talking to kids your age, I'll say he has an epiglottis that keeps all the water from going down his belly. There were words that the kids were saying that I can't even, <laughs> I can't remember, I don't even know. So it's really impressive the way that you're able to meld that all together. You know, the fact that I get to use animals and I have a lot of animal lovers there, I think it makes my job a little easier. I think if you find whatever your kid, if it's cars or cooking or dolls, whatever they're interested in, if you can try to teach their vocabulary around their interest, I think it helps a lot. It feels beautiful. Okay, let's scoot back and let's see. Katie said it feels beautiful. What else, do, what other words would people like to use to describe the way the snake feels? It feels clean, okay, so it feels beautiful. And smooth and dry. And smooth and dry. Everybody's heard that saying, can't judge a book by its cover. Some of my most exciting books, for some reason, have some very boring covers. Sometimes you have to go in and open the book and read it. So you cannot, judge an animal by looking at it, we really need to do our research. And what's a, a good place to do some research at? A library. A library. Where, another good place? A bookstore. A bookstore. Okay. Sometimes on the internet if we're, if we're careful which sites we go to. Sure. So there are a lot of different places you can learn and study animals. How can parents use pets to get their kids interested in reading? Well I've found I've had great success if, you know, I say to my girls, hey girls, let's go to the bookstore or the library and we're going to get a book on one of our dogs that we have or one of the animals that we have. And they get very excited to go to the store. It gets the parents more involved and the kids reading more. So we think it's a great connection. So the children are researching and it's also fostering maybe responsibility? Absolutely. Hello. He's resistant to poison. What else? What about his mouth? We found out something about his mouth. That has 44, up to 44 teeth. And if you don't have a pet, if you're watching something on TV, like Zubumafu or something like that, and the kids all love the lemur, you can say, you know, why don't we go to the library or the bookstore, and let's get a book, and we can learn all about Zabu. And the kid really gets the kids excited about it. Hi, Martine. Hey, Monty. I am so excited. I've borrowed every book that Ed has on animals, and I can't wait to read them all. That's great. You've got quite a pile there. I'm off to see Heather Blanchard. She's a second grade teacher and a mom. She's going to show me some fun ways to use books with kids. In fact, actually, I think she has her own book, so I won't really be needing this one. Would you hold it for me? Thanks. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> this book right here was given to my son for his birthday. What's the title of it? It is called Animals and Nature. OK. And it has all different kinds of animals and all different kinds of creatures. For example, this one right here. How do snakes protect themselves? Even with young children, they can look at the different colors. They can count the different kinds of snakes. They can see what different snakes do. Okay. There are some big words. Ed used a word camouflage earlier on. It talks about camouflage, highlights it, shows what it is. They also have little keys up here, just giving some general ideas. So parents can take a book like this, show the read it aloud, the pictures. show the pictures, mm -hmm. help them count through help them talk about the pictures, if it's even a little bit over their head. Definitely. How would you take someone who is maybe a pre-reader and, and work with this then? What would you do? When you're reading, show them the words so they can start to see what the words right, are. Right. Talk about, explain the larger words that are here. They have the word predators. They have the word venomous. So explaining that a predator is an enemy, very simple explanation for it. Venomous, poisonous, just putting it into words that they might understand more readily than the ones that are in the book. Some parents feel as if that's the role of the teacher. I mean, let's face it, they're going to be off in kindergarten, mm -hmm. off in first grade. Why should the parents get involved in that? Parents are the first and most important teacher in a child's life. When, by the time children come to kindergarten, even preschool, they've already been home for three or four years with their parents. True. And even during the summer, reading is the most important thing that they can do. It's the simplest thing. Anybody can. Anybody can pick up a book, look at the pictures, talk about it. You don't even have to be able to read the words. Just talking about it, noticing the different things that are going on in the pictures is a precursor to reading. Okay. Now, I see you've got a book that might even be more apropos for the younger child. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. 
We have this book over here, which we just picked up at the library. This is a brand new book, Zoology. Yep. And what's nice about this one, <laughs> we have a Wonderful. chameleon on every yes. page. This even relates to what Ed was talking about, this one right here in the trees. Yes. Talks about all different creatures that are arboreal. We also have another page that would appeal to even the youngest readers, and that's back here, black and white. Yes. Because the youngest children can see the contrast, and they can recognize, and these are all the black and white creatures. We have the skunk, we have the penguin, the zebra, all the different creatures. And what's neat about this one is each picture is labeled. Yes, it so, is. So even if the parent isn't doesn't know what a Malayan taper is, there's a picture of it, exactly. and it's spelled out for them. And what's great about this book is it puts them into different groups. You may see the penguin more than once. You may see the penguin in the list of creatures that are in cold places. You'll also see it in black and white. So the animals may appear more than once, so the repetition is really good for the children also. And I suppose, too, if a parent was really interested in doing storytelling mm -hmm. and had a, had a knack that way, Wow, what a springboard for a storytelling opportunity. They definitely, definitely could. And the children can even get involved because after reading or after visiting a place like Animal Adventures, they could draw their own pictures. Uh -huh. We have pictures and they can move from, first off, the earliest would be the pictures, just the actual drawing. Then they can start doing the labeling as we saw in the book. Then they can even start telling stories, either dictating the story and having the parent write it. And then as they get more advanced, they can do their own stories. It's always great to see the envelope uh, come in the mail. What will happen is a family will come here, a kid will fall in love with an animal. They write stories and color pictures and, and a little story usually why it's their favorite animal. It's, it was wonderful to see all of the projects and how enthused, how inspired the kids get by seeing all the animals. I really find when a kid is interested in something, you don't have to force them into it all on their own. Uh, they, you know, they, they go ahead and do it. Lemurs jumping. Snakes slithering. Alligators swimming. Hedgehogs sleeping. Ferrets playing. Animal, Animal Adventures is definitely, definitely the place to be. be. Have you seen all those animals here at Animal Adventures? Mm -hmm. Wow. Now I understand you actually do some work here at, uh, at Animal Adventures. What do you do? I work with algaes, crocodiles, <laughs> lemurs, algaes, stepping turtles. I what do I do? I give them medication, I give them mm -hmm. food, I give them their treats that they're supposed to get. I wow. give them mm -hmm. milk or care, I give them care, I give them love. This sounds like something you want to do uh, maybe with your life, is that right? Mm -hmm, that's true. How long do you think you'd need to study to do that? Is that, a, is that something you need to study for a long time before you did it? Yes. You looking forward to that? I'll start in summer camp. Is that right? How mm -hmm. did it start in summer camp? Because I went there, what? Last year for summer camp. summer camp. And um, I really loved animals, and so I decided to work here. Mm -hmm. You put in extra hours? I put in extra hours, like today, mm -hmm. to do all this. Mm -hmm. What kind of changes have you seen in Brian since he's come to work for Animal Adventures and, and come to really dig into the books of mm -hmm. animals? Brian's confidence has increased, his self-esteem has increased, um, he's not as introverted as he used to be, what and he's, you, you're more proud of yourself. You're, you're not shy you're anymore. Not shy. <laughs> Obviously. Not shy anymore. <laughs> and um, he's happy, he's happy. Obviously you're happy, you're enjoying this <laughs> tremendously. Yes. Kathy, Brian, thank you so much for talking with me. Anything else you want to tell me you're about welcome. animals? Um, I, I love it here. <laughs> That's what counts. Now what about your special needs children? Do you use special animals with the special needs kids? We really uh, come at them with everything and you know just see how they react and it, de it depends on the severity of the child but some of our special needs kids that we work with uh, myself I wouldn't even know their special needs unless I was told that. Um, because they just, they really connect with the animals. And the kids that are a little more severe, um, we just try all different things, you know, all different animals. Some love the furry, some love the scaly. So we just try a variety of different sensors, sensory things for them to try. So no animals are off limits? No, there's nothing off limits. Oh, you've got a cute nice little bunny there. Again, Monty. Good to see you, sir. Hi, Laura. Hi. Tell us a little bit about your bunny there. Hi, Eddie. This here is a white sock one of our many bunnies that we have here at Animal Adventures. And um, she has big ears, 
and big eyes and soft whiskers and fur. And Eddie likes the furry ones, right, Laura? <laughs> like okay, ones. see? And that's gonna have one feel, and mm -hmm. if he goes around and touches the whiskers, it's gonna be a lot uh, different. So obviously Eddie is enjoying himself and he enjoying is the bunny. Very much enjoying what do animals help Eddie bring out? Um, joy, mm -hmm. happiness. He's very happy, he's very calm, he's very content. Um, it, it brings a certain amount of peace for Eddie, truthfully. I think it brings a certain amount of peace and joy for all of us. Absolutely. <laughs> it's nice to see him enjoying the bunny so much. Yeah, he likes that one. He does like that. He does. Obviously he's communicating to us that this is something that he's really enjoying. Very much, very much. Laura, do you read to Eddie? Yes, Eddie, we do read to Eddie every day. In the classroom, he's read to, um, in recreational activities in the evening, he's read to. And oftentimes, after a story has been read to him, there'll be a follow-up activity to reinforce the story and reinforce the communication between um, what was read to him. Does he have favorite stories? Um, that I'm really not quite sure of. Um, what types of stories do you choose to read aloud then? We provide him with all types of stories. Um, he is 20 years old, so he, we try to read stories that are, pro, you know, history, current events, um, geography, anything that we really feel that we could enhance Eddie's quality of life and we'll try to cover that for him. I know that you have a special story about Yogi. Can you tell me about that? Sure. Uh, one day we had a field trip here of special needs children. And one little girl who was four, I guess, had never showed any kind of facial expression or anything like that. And as the kids were getting onto the bus, this little girl was the last one out, her and one of her teachers. And Yogi was in his cage, and he likes to dance and goof around. And the little girl stopped in front of his cage and stared at him. Then she started dancing and laughing and clapping. And I didn't know she'd never showed expression, so I was like, wow, that's pretty neat. And the uh, teacher with her started crying with tears of joy, ran out to the bus, grabbed the nurses and the other teachers, and they all came in, they were hugging each other, and uh, it was just one of those things that Yogi just triggered a reaction that you know, hadn't been offered to her before, and, I, and uh, just brought that out in her. And that made a, gr a huge difference in her life. So. It's amazing how children can react to the beauty of these animals and how it can make such a difference for them. I find that a lot, you know, the, the special needs children and really all, all people, they're just so, you know, nice and pure inside that something, you know, beautiful like this just brings it out in them for some reason. And just, they just connect, they seem to connect with nature really well and that day we happened to be Yogi. What a great adventure it's been. Now let's review the highlights of today's show. Like Ed Laquadera, Ask questions and use comparisons to help children remember new information. Don't lecture, put lessons in story form, and create fun and factual stories together. Lori Joy suggests to use pictures to stimulate discussion, build stories around new vocabulary, choose pictures that lead to adventures. Ed also suggests you visit the library before getting a pet. Test assumptions with hands-on exploration and use children's interests to introduce new words. Like Heather Blanchard, explore nonfiction books with young children. Use repetition to reinforce learning. Enable kids to communicate feelings and ideas on paper. And like Brian's mom, Kathy Brophy, encourage learning to promote confidence. Laura Pika finds it's important to recognize physical communication and respond to it and do follow-up activities that reinforce reading. And finally, be sure to use animals to help special needs children communicate. Now here's Miriam Marichak's recommended Words That Cook book list. Brought to you by the Cookie Bookie Bears. For Zero to Three, Animal Babies in Rainforests by Jennifer Schofield. And Touch and Feel Baby Animals by DK Publishing. For three to six, Animal Action ABC by Karen Pandell and The Umbrella by Jan Brett. For six to nine, Omnibeasts, Animal Poems and Paintings by Douglas Florian. Actual Size by Steve Jenkins and Slinky Scaly Slithery Snakes 
by Dorothy Hinshaw Patent. And for 9 to 12, Great Pets by Sarah Stein. Amazing Animal Facts by Jackie Bailey. And Animal Disguises by Belinda Weber. For a complete list of books, links, and other great ideas that will make reading fun for your kids, go to our website, wordsthatcook.org. Now you've got some new ideas to play with, so go and have some fun with Words That Cook, Parenting with Children's Books, In, in Your, your kitchen. kitchen.